please put your hands together and give a warm welcome to your host, Rick Ramsey. All right, all right, all right. That's my, that's my uh, Matthew McConaughey impersonation. How's everybody doing out there? Excellent. Good to hear you. We have a great audience here. Today we are here to talk about virtual production. What does this mean uh, for the future of filmmaking? And to be quite honest with you, it's not just about filmmaking. Um, all of you are familiar with virtual lots of things, right? For goodness sake, your, your education for the last two years has pretty much been, <laughs> been pretty much that environment. With us today, we have an esteemed panel. I am going to introduce them uh, to you, and then we're going to get started. Everybody good? All right. Well, sitting immediately right next to me to my right, I had to think about who, what's right or left here. On my right is Bryce DeCristofalo, Full Sail grad, producer, and he is a virtual production uh, consultant. So this is one of those few people who you can call up and say, hey, I want to put one of those in a studio, and he can show you how to do it. So that's super cool. Um, next to... Uh, Bryce is Kyle Frazier. Kyle, as of March 1st, is now Full Sail's very own virtual production studio manager. So he is managing our facility here. He's been a teacher at Full Sail for how long? Just shy of 10 years. Just shy of 10 years. You do have a mic, and you do, yeah, we want to make sure we yeah, use it. Just that. shy of 10 years. Just shy of 10 years. So that 10 year anniversary is coming up. Next to him, one of my absolute best friends, this guy changed my son's life by allowing me to take him to Ireland and actually visit the Game of Thrones set while they were shooting. We actually got to play with the weapons. Um, senior Vice President of Production at HBO. This is the guy responsible for Game of Thrones, Westworld, Sesame Street. Who doesn't love Sesame Street? Um, a host of other shows. Give it up for Mr. Stephen Barris. <laughs> and at the end there, um, absolutely uh, somebody I respect, admire, and is just an all-around fun guy. You really, you just, if you can hang out with this guy for five minutes, it will change your life. Um, this guy is the owner and CEO of his own production company called Scully Effects. And that company has done everything from television commercials. They actually worked on Westworld a little bit. Oh, I missed one. Sorry. I'm coming back to you. <laughs> Cully's on the end. Um, saving the best for last. Does that work? Okay. Saving the best for last. Uh, but Cully is um, just absolutely amazing. And you guys did work. You worked on Westworld, yes? And, of course, Stephen uh, is a producer there. Let's give it up for Mr. Cully Bunker, also a Hall of Famer, both him and Stephen. <laughs> And this is what happens when there's too many panelists. Um, you, f you forget the best ones. But I have to say, this guy, over the last several months, is just, for me, been a rock star. Uh, this guy is our program director for our Game Art. So where's our Game Art students again? Our Game Art program, which uh, shares the same central track as a computer animation program. That's that section up there, right? And. Uh, you're going to see some amazing stuff in the coming weeks uh, if you come by the virtual studio because we're shooting a film there uh, with William Forsyth and Michael Pere called Nine Windows. And all of the scenes, all of the environments were designed by his team and students already getting film credits before they graduate the full sale way. Please give it up for my friend and colleague, Mr. Chad Kendall. All right, so we, we spent the first four minutes on intros, now we're going to cut right into it. Um, what I want to do is I really want to spend, I want the students to have uh, uh, enough time for questions, but the first thing I want to do is kind of make sure we all understand what virtual production is, right? So I have a couple things to show you real quick. If you pay attention to the screens here, um, we have built, as you know, our very own virtual production studio. And here's a time lapse of that. And I'll just give you some uh, notes about it. This wall is 16 feet high. It spans 40 feet over in building 4D. There's an 18 by 18 foot ceiling and 5 million plus pixels to create our very own virtual production studio driven uh, by the Unreal Game Engine and N-Display. 
uh, and Brompton processors, which are at the very top of the line. I think any of these guys will tell you. And there you see Marcella and Jeremy, who have been absolutely instrumental in getting a lot of the stuff up on the screen. That's our very own virtual production studio. How many of you got to go to the tour, see it? Excellent. If you haven't, um, it's going to be very sketchy when we get in production. You know, SAG, right, because of all the rules they have. But try to stop by, right? We'll try to squeeze you in. Uh, definitely this week's a great time. Look up on the screen right now, and what you're just seeing is something Kyle shot when he was in Scotland on the train. This is my example of something called parallaxing, and it's what we experience in a 3D world. Everything close to us when we're moving moves very quickly, and everything in the distance moves very slow, right? You got to remember, remember as kids asking your mom or dad why the moon is following you? It's not, right? <laughs> but... If we were to take a still image or even video and put it up on a screen and dolly a camera across it, it would be super flat because there's no parallaxing. There's no recognition of 3D. But in the game world, there is a 3D environment. And if we can get that environment onto a screen, then we can show parallaxing as we move our camera. And that is the essence of virtual production. And uh, we haven't shown this much. This is a, a scene from one of our test scenes over in our own virtual production studio. This is a Victoria mansion. It costs $89.95, I think, <laughs> on the Unreal Marketplace. Super cheap for a whole set. There are only four pieces of furniture that are real in this entire set. Uh, that's it. Uh, the, middle, the center area, the big block there, is called the frustum. That is where the highest resolution is, and that is the camera's viewing area. So the game engine will uh, display that so our camera can see the very best res. Everything else around is out of frustrum. A uh, little bit of lower res to save some of that uh, rendering power. And the way this works is there's an infrared uh, camera on our live camera, and it shoots a signal up into a lot of reflectors that are in the ceiling, sort of like stars. It calibrates the camera's movement by recognizing where those stars are in the grid. And that information is relayed into the game engine. Then the game engine replicates that movement and pushes that out into the frustum. And that's how we get a 3D element. And if you want to see what that looks like to the camera's eye, here is that shot. A little oversaturated because I did it with my iPhone. But here is that shot. Again, only that first table, that couch, that lamp, and the globe that is coming up here are actually real. Everything else is being created by the game engine. And there you have it, folks. That's what Virtual Production 101 is. <laughs> so now what I want to do is I want to go quickly uh, through the panel, and I'm going to ask to start with Bryce. Just give us an uh, explanation of what your personal involvement is with virtual production. Um, and we're just going to start there and then see where it takes us. All right? Cool. Bryce, you're up, buddy. Uh, yeah. Am I actually on? Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, currently, like I said, if we were going from the producing side or what this new category is really virtual production producers, you know, it's just a, kind of a new idea. Um, so currently in that, but also in what Kyle is doing in the management side of things in another location. So... I don't know. I feel like I could talk about this for hours. So I'm going to say that's what I'm doing right now. Virtual oh. production producing. I don't. No, we have one hour. Right now. Okay, moving on to Kyle. There we go. <laughs> so uh, as, as was discussed earlier, I'm going to be the uh, manager for the virtual production stage here on campus. Um, so my really entry into this is only a few months old. Um, as I came in, as everything was just coming online. Um, but I, I come from a film background like most of you guys um, with about 15 plus plus ish years of cam opping and director of photography work. That's awesome. Um, I am Steve Barris. I work on a couple TV shows. Uh, some of those TV shows have um, virtual uh, sets now that we're rendering uh, in real time as we're shooting. One that you can actually go and watch right now, and you should, because it's great. Um, it is a uh, show from uh, our good friend Taiko Atiti uh, called Our Flag Means Death, uh, which is essentially The Office, but with pirates. And uh, <laughs> the uh, the pirate ship uh, sits inside of a Jace, uh, J-shaped 
uh, about a 21 foot tall uh, LED uh, display and is rendered virtually. And we have uh, background plates uh, that are in game engine uh, that uh, allow us to shoot on the deck of a pirate ship, a simple single camera half hour comedy, um, which wouldn't be possible without that technology. There's no way we're gonna master and commander a ship out in the middle of the goddamn ocean and try to put a bunch of comedians on that. It's impossible. It's not tenable for the budget of something like that. Um, and so I think for that reason, for that show, it's even more compelling than, of course, uh, for uh, a little show that we're calling House of the Dragon, uh, which is uh, the, your new favorite show uh, coming later this year, uh, all, uh, of course, from the world of A Game of Thrones. And that is uh, shooting a, a significant amount uh, on our V stage, uh, which is located at Warner Brothers uh, in beautiful Leavesden, just outside of London. Um, and at the time that we did it, and because this thing changes every day, but at the time we did it, it was the largest virtual stage in the world and still the only one that anyone has let us set fires inside of. So we still have that, we still have that record. So very exciting stuff, very exciting. Uh, Chad Kendall, uh, so my background has been real-time for 25 years. So I've been a real-time 3D artist, um, and so this is my first feature that I'm working on as well. Um, so in my mind, you know, in my perspective, the virtual production, what does this mean for my game artists? Uh, what does it mean for my 3D artists in terms of new opportunities? Um, you know, there's always been sort of a previous side in the film side of things. Maybe it wasn't as as sexy as games uh, for game artists coming out, but um, but now we have this sort of explosion of content that needs to be made and people that need to be com competent in uh, engines. And since that's what we do in our program, then it puts you in a pretty good position. So um, so I'm really excited. You know, we are sort of just finishing up our stuff. I was I've been working on some stuff this morning myself in Unreal and lost a bunch when it crashed because um, that's what happens. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's you know it's it's, it's exciting. Um, so yes, definitely like Rick said, come by if you can and check out the shoots and stuff. Well, uh, I'm Cully Bunker. I've owned a visual effects company and been a, vis a visual effects artist for about 22 years. And I saw the writing on the wall. And uh, my company's getting into pre viz and post viz, doing virtual production and uh, virtual humans. Excellent. Um, so, as you can see, there's a wide gamut of experience here. But the really amazing thing, and, and a little bit daunting, is I find that no one has the full gamut of, of experience. There's always somebody who's tried something different, right? So just to brag a little bit, um, Kyle and Chad, when we were running tests at Victorian Houses 1, um, and not downing wonderful shows like Mandalorian, but it is so much easier in a virtual environment to put a desert up, right? When you try to put a house up and you have all these different depths, it's a real challenge. And uh, Chad's team built a whole basement for this movie, and we were doing some tests with it yesterday. It has a virtual staircase. And you would look at that through the camera, and you'd swear the staircase was real. The parallaxing on every step was there. And if you were there, you heard the audience go, oh, which is exactly what you want, right? So it is an amazing technology. And I find, you know, Cully, on your end, uh, I want to ask, really, what are some of the more challenging applications? Because your company, I mean, you're all over the place when it comes to effects, whether it's movies, commercials, music videos. Right. Yeah. Like what have you found that has been, you know, maybe one of the real gratifying experiences that you've had a challenge and you met it through virtual? Well, it's it's very early. We've only worked on a couple projects so far, um, but we did a Pepsi campaign last year where we did the post biz and I could see that uh, it was a, like a five day shoot, but we had five locations with a day each. Uh, prepped and done on set with the foreground objects all ready to go, wheeled in. So they did what in five days, I believe, that it would take weeks uh, in different locations, transporting crew, transporting gear. Uh, so the, 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 the uh, time savings, uh, it took like a, a $5 million project and made it a million dollar project. So in us working on it afterwards, there was a lot of pitfalls and advantages. We, we have to make sure that we're eliminating any shots or uh, defocusing areas of um, 
Moray, mm -hmm. which is something I'm sure you're going to talk about soon. Uh, you know, and, and just finding the places where it works and where it doesn't, and, and making sure that in post viz that we make it look as pos possible. But you know, the speed and and uh, the quality is just you know, it, it looks like you're there. It's amazing. Yeah, when you get it right, it's it's breathtaking because you know the you know the magic trick and you're still taken away, right? Um, Stephen, uh, you know, kind of almost the same question, but you have a real comparison because, you know, I was on set for Game of Thrones. Well, sets. I mean, you literally have to travel halfway across Ireland mm -hmm. to do all the sets. Um, What's the difference for HBO doing House of the Dragon with mostly virtual versus Game of Thrones where you were multiple locations? Yeah, I mean, the original series, we would look at, um, you know, and, and specifically Rick was there when we did the large boat battle in season seven. And a lot of that um, had to be green screen. That's all we had at the time. That's the only thing we could do. And one really specific example, I guess, of where uh, there's a big difference and I think a benefit is that when we do a giant green screen shot like that, every second of footage that we capture is a visual effect shot there is no way around it um, we have a big giant green curtain encircling our boats and everything we do inside of that space is a visual effect shot every extra pickup we get every time we grab a little bit of green screen it becomes a visual effect shot um, whereas for house of the dragon uh, 80 percent or higher i think in most cases uh, of everything that we shot in the volume space was more or less ready to go there's probably a little bit more time that we spend grading it, but that's not nearly as expensive as the time we spend on scent. There's probably a little bit of time, to Kali's point, we spend fixing edges and fixing seams and more and you know figuring out where smoke caused problems and stuff like that. But again, that is a few shots in uh, you know several dozen versus every single shot that we shoot on green is just going to be a visual effect shot. There's no way around it. And so I think for that reason alone, on a show as big of house of the dragons it gives us the flexibility to be able to do more in that space to simply spend more time on the craft on the dialogue on the characters that you guys will all fall in love with or hate or whatever uh, that comes from their performance that doesn't come from us shooting them against green um, and so we still spend a lot of time on on location we still spend an awful lot of time establishing locations getting that amazing drone photography of a location and uh, maybe even coming into print talent in that location but then we're going to go inside in the volume and we're going to have the led screen slightly out of focus in the background as opposed to you know the north sea which is loud and cold and raining and muddy sideways and every other thing whereas we can be at leaves in comfortable inside the stage and there's challenges in there there's some weird audio things and stuff like that but those pale in comparison to the work that we would have to do to shoot a you know, three and a half page scene on the top of a hill in the middle of Northern Ireland. And Rick knows he's been there. It is windy as all get out. It's rainy. It's, you know, and that just had to be what Westeros was for the original series. It rains in Westeros a lot because it rains in Northern Ireland a lot. And there just isn't enough that we can go to cover for. So we just dealt with it. Um, but that's not the best way to get the best performance uh, all the time. And so uh, it does allow us to be more flexible like that. And like I said, with the with the pirate show, that's 90% dialogue standing on the deck of a ship where we're going to have the ocean out of focus in the background. If every single one of those shots was a visual effect shot because there was green behind us, which we can do, we can put green on the LED anytime we want if we need something really fancy. Um, but 90% of the stuff that we would do uh, came out in camera. And that, for something like a comedy or something like You May Shoot Here, um, that's amazing. That gets you this incredible production quality without having to spend a huge amount of time in visual effects, which is not always you know, incredibly expensive, but it's almost always time consuming. Um, and at some point, that does equal dollars. And that can also be a qualitative trade-off. Whereas if you see it on the screen, like Rick showed, and it looks good, then it looks good. You're you're done. Like you, you may color correct. You may do some stuff, but for the most part, you've got what you need, and you can you can move through it. And lastly, I'll say, 
I also think it's huge for actors. Just like you said, Rick, when you step on that stage and you see it through the camera and you go, wow, this is so cool. But imagine you're an actor standing on that stage and all of a sudden the forest comes out around you. All of a sudden a throne room comes up around you. All of a sudden a spaceship comes up around you and you are all of a sudden much more in that scene than you would if you are clouded by green and you actually get the, uh, I don't know if you've heard of this, you sort of the, the green haze where people just start to, your eyes can't look at that much green for long periods of time. You really do start to kind of like wig out a little bit. It's hard, it's really bright. We, we light the crap out of the green screen so that we get a good key. Um, and you're looking off into no horizon, into just all of this green and tracking dots and stuff for days at a time. It's hard, it's hard work. It's hard on actors to do that. And so being able to render them into a representation of a real space is just so much better for getting them into a better performance space, which ultimately, you know, it's a big job of us in production to put them in a performance space where they're comfortable. Yeah, I, I have to totally agree. I know we, doing, we were doing a session in the virtual studio yesterday in the basement scene that we're going to use in the movie. And you're sitting in there, and it's like, all you have to do is out of your peripheral, it feels like you're in another world. It's almost like step past the threshold and all this disappears, you know? But it was just such a really cool experience. Um, Kyle, you know, Cully and Stephen have mentioned Moray, and I don't know, how many of the audience know what that is? And so I'm going to ask Kyle if he'll kind of explain in virtual production, what, what is the, that Moray effect and what are, you, what are you looking at and what's causing that? Okay, so um, Moray is something that has been around since we started going to digital and got away from film. Um, and you'll see it on your TV sometimes. If someone's wearing a real tight pattern on their shirt, it'll look like it's dancing, kind of jiggling back and forth. Um, so that's Moray, and that, that can happen with any, any type of shooting. But what you have to think about now is we're shooting a wall, but we want it to look like it's in 3D space. But if I focus on the wall, you're going to see all those tiny little LED dots, right? And the tiny little LED dots, if they're in focus, will create a moray. So that's why you need to, as, as he kept saying, it's an out-of-focus shot. The background's soft, and that keeps you from getting the moray so you don't have to paint it out. And this is where your knowledge of depth of field really comes in and understanding you know, um, what's in, what, what your focal plane is, um, where, where that distance lies, because you need to work with that both in the game engine and in camera to make sure that you're not having to paint the moray out afterwards. Um, and that's why a lot of the virtual studios are using large format is because, as you know, the bigger the chip, the shallower the depth of field, the easier it is to kind of keep that moray from coming coming in. When do you think pixel pitch on displays is going to be at the point where you won't have to worry so much and you will be able to make that part of the connective scene as opposed to having to sort of throw it out? I think it's, it's going to be quick. Like just from, um, you know, in the last year, the pixel pitch has dropped. So pixel pitch, if you guys don't know what pixel pitch is, is the amount of distance between the pixels. So the closer those pixels get, the less chance you have of more, and it becomes more of a solid. So um, in the next, you know, a couple of years, that pixel pitch is going to get down to the point where you'll be able to, you, if you want to have a wide depth of field, you'll be able to have that without outrunning the risk of seeing the, the more. So um, <clears throat> the other side of that, though, is not just in the pitch, but the camera technology and the enhancement there. Um, my son, I will always brag about my son, so if you hear me, it's always gonna happen because he works at a virtual studio in VIEW, game development grad, by the way. Um, but he just sent me a picture of the new Sony Venice 2, uh, which is a 65 millimeter chip, and he said they're 10 feet from the screen and no more. So uh, excited about that. Sony, if you're listening, we need to borrow one of your cameras. Thank you. Um, no, not yet. Anyway, um, Chad, I was, you know, I am so thankful and dependent on your students and your staff to pull off what we're trying to do. And I, I want you to maybe illuminate a little bit for our, uh, for our students here. What is this... What does virtual production mean to the game art student? Like, what, what opportunities are suddenly uh, there for them that they may not have even thought were possible before? 
Yeah, um, you know, obviously it's huge. And um, the one thing that I've noticed uh, the most is um, how many studios there are in all over, right? So game studios tend to be lumped in particular parts of the country or other part or other countries. Um, whereas we're seeing these things kind of pop up everywhere. So it's like, you know, there's one, there's always going to be one like 50 or 100 miles away. You know, it's, there's kind of been that many that have been popping up. Um, and they need people to go in there and do that stuff. Um, and they'll have enormous setups and build these great things and have awesome film crews, and they'll be like, wait a minute, we don't have uh, any Unreal Tech people um, to do any of this stuff. Um, and there's a whole, you know, list of jobs, right? So you're going to have on-set TDs that are going to be running the, you know, uh, the stuff that's coming through. Um, and then you're going to have people that need to digitize stuff, to scan stuff, to make it from scratch. Um, you're going to have to have lighters. So you have all of these things. And it's using the same core skills that you would to make a game. But when you are sort of diving into virtual production, you have to think about things in terms of sets, right? So you're not thinking about collision and, and gameplay or level design, right? So you're thinking about things. You have to build things oftentimes in odd ways, um, like the, our basement, for example, is like 10 feet tall, um, because otherwise it just wouldn't, you know, wasn't, wasn't shooting correctly. So um, it's not like you're necessarily replicating life. But it's, yes, it's huge for game artists. I'm kind of a big uh, evangelist for everything not games, even though I'm the game person, because I always want my students to know that there's tons of jobs for real-time artists. Right, whether it be simulation or architectural visualization. Um, and then this one is huge. And I don't think I even realized when I was first looking into it how huge it was going to get and how everybody was going to adopt it and how fast. Um, I think certainly COVID helped that along. Um, yeah. But there's a lot of reasons just in terms of good production. So, so um, I just... Just as an example, um, where's uh, any game development, game design? I know we didn't have a lot of game design. We did have a few game development students, right? Okay, so the hinge pin here for you is your experience with Unreal. So your computer animation students, your game art students, your game design students, game development students really have that experience. And you just put that on resume, and the, some of these places will just eat you up immediately. They'll just scarf you up. And the pay is good. Um, it's a little bit a wild west, so s big studios pay bigger than smaller studios, but uh, the pay is good. I mean, I'm not, you know, buying my son meals anymore, so uh, <laughs> happy about that. Not paying his rent, so it uh, it does seem to work out. Not paying his car payments, um, so I really encourage you to kind of look into that. You know, look at uh, if you work in Unreal, you go to the marketplace. The the environments are really inexpensive. Find you some decent environments download the virtual production uh, ones and work with them, right? And then if there's any time, hate to put you on the spot, Kyle, shoot Kyle if you want to throw something up on the screen and see how it looks. Let's, let's I have one of these, yeah. Yeah, let's Just take drop a me look an email. at it. Yeah. We are, um, you know, Ch Chad and I have talked for the last several months about Full Sail building its own environment library. And honestly, I'm stoked because the environments that they've been able to build so far are like top notch, like absolutely uh, top notch. So just encourage you to really do that. You can even be an entrepreneur. There's there's tons of stuff on CG Trader and Marketplace that have been created by other artists that you can put up there. And right now, Unreal's not taking a cut on virtual production stuff like they do with games, which is only 5%. I imagine that'll stop, right, don't you think, at some point? Yeah, they'll probably start charging. Um, last question, I'm going to throw it to you guys for Bryce. <clears throat> Tell me, you know, from a producer standpoint, what's the economics when it comes to virtual? Like, is your crew size bigger? Is it smaller? Um, what are some of the advantages on the financial side of that? Um, well, as well as what Stephen was saying about utilizing that example between producing two different shows, right? Now, when you have a controlled environment, right? And to give a little backstory, I was mentored by a Disney Imagineer actually here. Named Rhett Wickham. So these were magicians that learned how to make things in boxes. And by the way, the final image you see is going to be in that little box. Remember this. So the economic factor is what he was talking about is dailies as well. You're going to have your dailies lined up pretty much, I mean, again, I'm not saying calling final pixel for certain shots. It might be brought in through Maya assets or a little bit of color, you know, this and that. But really, you're looking at about 80% every single day. So now your workflow, boom, is higher. The other thing is, because the old studio systems were just like that. They used to have, in tandem, studios running productions. I mean, literally, you'd be sitting there having lunch, and they'd be like, you're going to be an army man today. 
and they would rotate you through, right? So if you have that thought process, it's not that you have less people. You do have a lot more skilled technicians, and you'll have skilled technicians that will be highly in demand, right? Kind of like that system was before, and because this is expanding, right? And it's becoming the new normal because of that. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to go see a James Bond movie or Transformers where they're not blowing up cars outside. Um, and to explain this is what you're explaining is an optical effect. So really in the effects world, there really is optical effects, digital visual effects, and special effects. By definition, optical effects is just gone with the wind. They're going to shoot the plate. They're going to actually literally paint glass <laughs> and then take another photo they shot, and they're rolling up to a house that you think is, you know, beautiful. And no, it's just a piece of glass on a, you know, thing. Then you have um, a special effect, which is actually in camera, but that's mostly pyro or animatronic is a special effect. Then you have a visual effect, which does take a lot of time. And it's extremely, I mean, the data management of this thing, pipelines, oh my God, it just takes money and time to do that, right? So I'm not saying visual effects go anywhere because we, of course, need them. Of course, we are going to need people in the digital arts community that also want to get into gaming and also get into this community as well. So I think from the cost-effective side, yes, this is more cost-effective on time, but also, again, when it comes to these skilled people, you'll be in a very high demand. So I think the job market will be coming larger, right, than it would be. I don't see it going anywhere. It's only going to get bigger. Cool. So we're going we're gonna to take questions in just a minute. Um, I do want to say we, we did have Orlando Business Journal, Kyle and I, they interviewed us, and they asked us, what is your one frustration? There has to be something. And I can tell you, uh, from my experience and the thing that my son does call me the most about, is people, industry people, coming in for a shoot and they don't understand the technology. And so you really have to take the time to explain. Uh, and so you are at a huge advantage because the technology is here. It's available to several degree programs. You can walk out the store having more knowledge than 90% of the people in the industry are ready. And that is gold. That really is gold. All right? We're going to take questions. Let me tell you how this is going to work. Um, you'll line up at the back, and then you'll be brought down to the front, or you'll be d directed to come down to the front to the microphone here. And then it will be one person at a time. So the line will be back there so we don't block the camera. If you have a question for a certain panelist, please just say, hey, Stephen, I was wondering. Uh, but if it's for the whole panel, you can say it's for the whole panel. Um, and then we'll just take it from there. All right? Sound good? All right. So do we have any questions? If you do, just the first one down to the microphone oh, is the geez. first one down to the microphone. The rest the of you have to go The first one with a broken ankle uh, running down the stairs. The rest of you have to go to the back. All right. So uh, camera, you guys, I know you're seeing people walking. That's great. We have tons of questions. Awesome. Sir, please state at least your first name, and then what's your question? Hi, I'm Chris. I'm in Entertainment Business Masters. I did undergrad in film. So my question is, it sounds like overall this is so beneficial that almost the temptation might be to take it too far and just do everything virtual. <laughs> so my question is, what do you guys see as kind of the limit of balancing that ease and maybe cheaper versus you know, th this type of project should be done physically yeah I, I'll, I, I'll start I think um, Joe Bauer who is a very good friend and incredible uh, visual effects uh, supervisor um, did um, Game of Thrones uh, for us uh, always said if you believe the fire you'll believe the dragon meaning that the more we can do real the more we can actually pull off physically the more the audience will buy it right so obviously the dragons are not real Unfortunately, yeah. sorry to, to ruin it. <laughs> but, um, the, but the fire is to the point where we built an animatronic flamethrower that would animate the, the fire breathing of the dragon in the Mirren fighting pits. Um, because if you believe that spray of fire, you believe that uh, stunt person being set ablaze, then the digital dragon behind it all of a sudden becomes way more real. And I think that virtual production, when used appropriately, is also that. 
that. You don't put the most important thing on the LED volume because it has to be out of focus for the most part now. So you put part of the spaceship in the foreground. You put, But you do that for things that you couldn't build, you couldn't really go to for whatever reason, and cost is a reason you can't go somewhere. Just because the Sistine Chapel exists does not mean you are allowed to shoot your movie in there. Um, and so there are, there are aspects of, of production where you try to get to the most real that you can afford, that is feasible, and that is literally possible in some cases. The Mandalorian's a great example. They're going to places that don't exist. And so the virtual environment allows you to make something that otherwise wouldn't exist. But I do think that, especially when it comes to close-up magic stuff, physicality is really important. And we've taken a big step backwards towards, backwards, I would say forwards, sideways, whatever, to physically fabricating props. We're using all of this amazing 3D printing technology, additive manufacturing to create Props that work. Star Trek phasers that have all the lights and the buttons click and the things press. A, because it evokes a better performance. B, because I don't have to do any visual effects to do it. And C, because it's a real thing and therefore we all buy it as a real thing. The actors buy it as a real thing. It's actually there. That's why we see a big uh, resurgence of rubber work in, uh, in monster movies and things like that. We see physical, uh, you know, as many physical characters you know, person in suit technology as we do fully digital characters. And it's because there's the realism to that that you buy that you don't necessarily, if everything is all digital because that's just an easier way to do it. And, you know, then you sort of end up with like a Hallmark Christmas movie with a robot dog, you know? And you're like, well, like, I guess, you know, but I don't uh, care. You know? I was going to say to, you, to the benefit of what Steven's saying, I tell everybody I went to the school of Carpenter and Hitchcock. That's actually what we're making here is a Hitchcock movie, right? I love practical effects. I want as much practical, real things in camera as possible. This is just a tool. Remember that. This is just a tool. Everything here are just tools. They just are manipulated to do what you would like them to do. It's a great tool, but it will not take away the things we all love. Fair? All right. Thank you for your thank question. You. Appreciate it. Sorry, time next up, I was like, the time while we're waiting for the next person, um, this nine windows, the title of the feature we're shooting here, is 98% virtual. And the only reason is it's a big experiment. Yeah. Um, it's a producer's dream because it's only a house, a basement, and a car scene. Uh, and the only 2% that's not is, is a fire. And we're not doing that on our stage. <laughs> you do that on your stage, Steven. We're not doing it on our stage. All right, sir, what's your question? Hey, uh, my name is Ryan Bolin, um, and uh, my question for everyone is, do you think that these virtual panels will fully replace green and blue screens one day in the future? And if so, when do you predict that so? Uh, budgetarily, no. They're very expensive, and a green screen is very cheap. That's, I mean, it comes down to that right there. If you have one, and you need it for a reason, and you don't have a background, you can pop it up real quick. Uh, if the director decides that there's a scene that they didn't, they didn't really plan for, because that's, this is a big thing, and a lot of clients aren't going to understand this, when you're using a screen, you have to prepare and make everything before you go instead of after. So I'm sure that, that it will be used, but uh, a, a green screen is much, much, much cheaper. I feel like to that point, too, the, you got to start thinking about it a little bit differently. So if there's something that pops up on set that you didn't plan for, you can't, you can't really do it. So the, a lot of the stuff that we, you normally would do in post, because you just shoot on a green, shot on a green screen, gets moved into pre-pro. So everything's there ahead of time and if you have this like stroke of genius where you want to shoot up to the top of a building and they didn't make the top of a building then you can pop in the green screen and it'll still be there so but the other nice thing too is he was talking about they would light the crap out of their green screens because it makes it easier to get a key you don't have to light the green screen if you pop it onto your wall it's just there it's illuminated exactly as it needs to be and you're ready to go they actually use a combination. I don't know if you saw the making of the Mandalorian. Sometimes they follow them around with a green square because they need to do stuff later. They, but they're getting all the lighting on the, the outfit because it's highly reflective, and that was the main reason for doing it in the first place. And now they've created this whole industry pretty much. Yeah, you know, we're a long ways off on creatures and things like that, being able to be rendered in real time to the quality that you would expect in a film. Um, and so that's one of the times where you're going to see backgrounds, but then the green screen pop up because there's a creature back there or something on the flip side this is a great question um because when you're on set or doing your pre your pre-production work 
these are the discussions you have. How should we do this? I mean, we've had many of them with nine windows. But one thing I will say in favor on the virtual side is the reflective quality. Anything that you have that's reflective, it's reflecting that environment. So instead of seeing green that you're going to have to fix later, you're seeing the lights on the ceiling or car headlight. You're seeing all of that um, in the reflections of the glass, of, of any tabletop surfaces, bottles, right? It all looks supernatural. So there's a real advantage if you can do it. But as Cully pointed out, it's super expensive. So it's not, green screen's not going to go away right away. It's funny if you ever watch the Unreal teaser, uh, they have all these different places. Some guy says with a French accent, there will be a day when we say green screen, your services are no longer needed. <laughs> that day has not come yet. But Non sequitur, we sometimes will have people show up on set that we can't crowd control out, like some guy who just wants us to pay him to get rid of him, and we have little pop-up green screens that we'll set in front of them so that we can, <laughs> we can comp them out. They usually go away after about two minutes of having a green screen in front of them, but for that reason alone, we'll, uh, it will, they'll, they'll always be around. All right, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. All right, yeah, great question. Oh, he's trying to get the comp work. He's trying to get the comp work. Turn up your ghetto blaster and stand in the back. Let's just green screen you out. Uh, hello. Right, first, first off, I want to say, hey, Stephen, uh, we met yesterday. I uh, remember. Oh, there we go, everybody. I remember the Spengler-esque hair. I'm a big fan. I'm a Thank big you. fan. You see, me and him, we're practically best friends at this point. Yeah, practically <laughs> best friends. <laughs> anyway, the question I have is, uh, what do you say the learning curve is for virtual production? Because a lot of us here, we are film. We All we care about is film. A lot of us have not touched Unreal Engine or a lot of this game uh, game developing stuff. So how difficult would you say this is? Yeah, you're asking the same question that basically every filmmaker we work with is asking, <laughs> honestly, because it, it's true. You approach it from the things that you know. I think, you know, we talked about my panel yesterday how I, I think it's unlikely that a Martin Scorsese will make the next great VR, you know, the transformative VR work. Um, you know, that may also be true to a certain extent for folks who have been working in the traditional film industry for a long time, really taking advantage of the virtual production world in a really meaningful way. I think it will be emerging uh, talent that will really do amazing new, totally different things in that space. Things that that we're sort of you know a little weighed down by all of the uh, legacy that we have attached to all of the work that we've done up to this uh, point. And it, it is tough for creative to sort of understand where all the pieces move around because we no longer have the art department hammering nails. We now have a virtual art department uh, hammering virtual nails, except those nails get hammered seven months before we end up on stage shooting something. And even the biggest sets don't take that long to build. Um, and we we don't have the, the same ability to sort of, as something's being built, you know, see it coming together in the room and understanding like, ooh, that's not quite right. Instead, we have sort of rough mock-ups in computers and it's, it's hard for a traditional team to sometimes conceptualize that. So I think that's why it's so important to have of new, fresh minds with a really good sense of the sort of underlying technology that makes all this work. You don't have to be able to do this in Unreal because you are sitting, well, with those three people from the animation group yeah. are there. Make, but, make friends you know, with game art students. Yeah, that's the point, right? That's yeah. exactly it. That's what we're doing. Yeah. We're making we're making friends with, uh, you know, our friends in game, you know, companies uh, to, to get that art together. Sean McKay and I, I talk about it a lot, where we probably have more work going for Forward with Insomniac or something like that uh, in the next five years on the non-game side than we do with the game licensing side because that's a great place to start mining the people who are absolute experts at creating totally photo real and incredibly efficient runtime stuff because it's not just about making it look good it's actually got to work in real time mm -hmm. which is something that i was certainly naive to a few years ago and now i'm acutely aware of um and that's that's a that's a special talent as well but you don't just like every filmmaker that we work with we don't have to learn that to the point where we can execute it we have to learn that to the point where we can speak fluently with our colleagues uh in in other disciplines so that we can get to a shorthand, they understand my weird, nonsensical, nebulous film terminology, and I kind of know what it means to say something won't run in real time with that amount of reflection or, or something like that, right? And, and I think that's the key. You don't have to learn how to do it to the point where you're an expert and you can go and do it, mm -hmm. because maybe that's not what you want to do, but 
like any good film student, and you've probably heard me say this before, you should know every position on set to the point where you're fluent to talk to the department heads of that particular position. That's your job as someone who works on set. Whether you're the director, the cinematographer, or an on-set PA, you should know what every department head does. You should know how to speak their language. You should know all the dumb names for film lights. You should know, you know all of that little secret code stuff mm -hmm. because then you can speak fluently, you can get to the point very quickly, you can help translate your ideas and hopefully help translate their ideas to folks that maybe aren't as fluent as you are. Okay, well thank you very much. Uh, that cleared a lot of things up for me. Thank you very much. Awesome. Yeah. Great question. As our next question uh, makes their way down, I, I just wanna say, in my experience, it's a short one, uh, about a year, um, I have found there are three basic lanes in virtual production. Uh, so if we call virtual production a highway, there's a film lane, there's an IT lane, and there's an environment uh, artist lane. And uh, all of you are driving the same highway, but you all have to look out for each other. And you have to work together. If you can get that to work, in film, your biggest connections are your cinematic skill sets uh, and your lighting. Those are the two biggest things that are always being conferred with the gaming side and the IT side. That so was almost a Tom Petty song. You were yeah, like almost, one, right? Yeah, almost. Something I want to recommend that's uh, a collaborative workflow uh, tool is called um, Omniverse. It's by NVIDIA, and it's kind of connecting a lot of these things together for collaborative workflow that can be done on the fly. It's really an amazing piece uh, of technology that you should look into. Yeah, that's a great call. What's your question, sir? Okay, first... I want to follow someone on Instagram, Steve. Oh, wow, Steven, you're so popular. <laughs> 10 points to Hufflepuff, Don't thank worry. you. I'm still searching for the rest of you. <laughs> All right, but anyway, my question is, how do you see this actually escalating in the future, like, um, industry-wise? Well, I, that's a very nebulous question. Let's, uh, let's sharpen that pencil a little bit, get a little more specific. Uh, how do you think the companies will all slowly start to get this technology themselves that still haven't like adapted to it just yet? Yeah, good sharpening. Thank you. Um, so I think there are there are two streams, um, and maybe this is your question, but this is the question I'll answer. Um, there are studios uh, like ours, like Warner Brothers, that are building because we have the space and and we have the capital to do it because we recognize it as something that's really 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 important to the industry going forward. And there are uh, sort of outside enterprises that are building these spaces all over, all over the place. One thing that the industry has recognized is this is something that we need to do fundamentally because as I've said before, I think this is as changing a technology as digital cinema was, as the introduction, uh, the introduction in a large scale of digital cinematography into film and television about a decade, a decade and a half ago. Um, and certainly so far as large scale you know, drama television is concerned about a decade ago. Um, I think this will enact the same type of change, the same type of uh, democratization of the type of imaging that you can do on a television scale budget, certainly a network television scale budget. Um, and so I think you'll see these places popping up and then how we ultimately lean into that, I think that's yet to be seen because right now, just building the building full of LED panels does not a virtual production make, right? There is the art piece, there is making that art piece native to the show, and then there's the execution piece of that against the, the show. So all of these departments that right now, you know, there's a virtual production department, just like a virtual cinematography department or a digital cinematography department, that eventually got absorbed into all of the different uh, disciplines. I've said this about uh, art direction because I think there's a lot of parallels here. Uh, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, no one had digital drawings. No one had AutoCAD drawings. People who had AutoCAD experience from industrial design started to get high hired as consultants onto shows that were really big, building giant sets, and they could do construction drawings. Now, every single art department in the world has AutoCAD designers, AutoCAD uh, you know, operators on their staff, and, and usually those are you know, the folks working natively in that department because that department has become digital native 
as it relates to construction drawings. The same thing is gonna happen with virtual production. The people that make these assets will become part of our art departments and they will simply work in the art department, uh, much like our construction crews do, much like our physical uh, artists uh, and set dressers and dramaturges and stuff do now. Uh, it will be the same thing, except they will work inside of a, a computer instead of inside of a Home Depot. All right. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Nice meeting y'all, by the way. Really, it's an honor. Um, as we're as our next person's coming down, we're getting close to time, so I just want to let you know we'll probably have we will have time for this question. Maybe the next one. Is there any more questions? Um, yeah, it might be it might be a little tough after that. So uh, we will be here. I think we can hang out for a little bit after. But uh, all right, go ahead. What's your question? Uh, so I'm big into like grip and electric kind of work, and what are things like this is more of like a department specific kind of question. What are things that grip and electrics don't do anymore on a virtual set or do? That's a great yeah. Yeah, so um, nothing. All the, all the same stuff. Um, the the difference lies in the detail work, right? So right. right now, like if you're shooting on a set, you you build the light from the ground up. In the virtual space, that base light is there. And then you use a lot more modifiers and a lot more small specular lights to accent and to recreate what you're seeing in the CG world in the real world. So um, you were there yesterday, you saw the basement scene. In the basement for the movie, there's a crack in a window that lets moonlight through, right? Mm -hmm. So to have that in our, in our space, we have the ambient light, but now we bring in just a small little tweeny with some, some CTB on it and shine it on the, the talent. And now the, the light that's in the fake world is replicated in the real world. So it's all the same same things. It's just dialed in and a little more um, technique-based and a lot more modifier-based than it is. And it, it, it even granularly goes down to the panels. You have a, mm -hmm. an iPad with you, and you have a color chart and a, and, a, and, a, and a luminance chart, and you can take that panel and make it a light if it's off screen to help you light your, your scene. It's really ingenious. That's what I was gonna ask. Like, could you use the screen to like help light, like yes. make it brighter in oh, certain 100%. areas? They yeah. have Is wheeled in panels. Is it an OLED panel? Is it like OLED, like you can light individual Just pixels? an LED panel. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you can, uh, you, okay. Gotcha. So you can't just say you have pixels here and you wanna only light those specific pixels. Uh, yeah, yes, they're, they're module, like, like little <laughs> Legos, but again, it depends on what the, uh, the engine you're working with, which is a whole other enchilada, meaning what they had done with Disney building their own proprietary system, if we're doing something 4.27, or if we're, again, working in 5, 5 is where we want to all be at here on the stage working constantly, because it's about lumens. Real-time lumens is where light becomes this before baking it in, but that's a whole right. other conversation. I, the one thing I will add is it's not... It's great at fill light. We've actually put, as Cully suggested, we've actually put a, a light in the Victorian scene. You don't see it, but there's a there's a light up in the ceiling panel, um, and it looks weird. It looks like there's a ghost floating there because we didn't put a, a digital fixture, a virtual fixture. We just put the light to give us a little bit of fill. What it's not good at is focus light. If you want that shafting that you would get from a gobo, you're not going to really get that. So. To Kyle's point, if you wanted to enhance that moonlight and there's dust in the air, you really probably should put a gobo and a source four, shoot that through the scene, because uh, you can really control that focus. Yeah, in, in my experience, you grip the shit out of shit, because mm -hmm. like th way more so than you would on a normal set, because everything right. is a friggin' two inch square of light over here that needs, so you've got you know jungle gym worth of kit around every instrument to be able to do that. So there's actually, I would say, you need a much more sophisticated uh, grip department that needs a lot more little shit than they usually carry. And that's another thing that people have to sort of come up to speed with. Plus, we use a ton of sky panels because you can grab the sky panel inside mm -hmm. of not necessarily the engine, although that stuff is coming and ILM can do that. But um, but there, you know, the next step is that you know via DMX or whatever, um, you'll grab the sky panels and you'll actually drive sky panel along with the LED right. volume so that you can mix those actual punchy real lighting instruments along with the volume to be able to actually move your light reinforcement along with the volume, which is the sort of next step of being able to do some really neat stuff. Because if we just rotate light on the volume, it's just too diffuse to really punch on actors. It doesn't read the way you would want it to. So as soon as we can 
can start really harnessing the ability to move DMX controlled lights, right. um, uh, both physical moving wiggle lights and actual sky panel sort of wash lights. It's that's going to be huge, and that's all genie stuff, right? It's mm -hmm. all there's a ton of friggin' cables and sparkies yeah. and all kinds of shit to make that stuff work. So now I think it's actually going to be a major uh, increase in work for genie. Give it up for that's the panel, enough. you guys. Thank we're you. we're staying around to answer as many questions as we can. Happy Hall of Fame, Full Sail. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it.